Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Autism Advocate. So today, I'm going to be sharing some of my personal experiences with the way that other people perceive me, as opposed to the way that I experience myself and the things around me. And I'm also going to highlight several mismatches and patterns, both in the way that I look and the way that I think and act towards other people which are kind of recurring patterns that have shown up in my life experience. And I hope that for those of you listening with autism, maybe you can relate. For those of you who are neurotypical listening to this, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to consider what it is like living a life experience that is different from your own. I think that deserves some major kudos. So thank you. Thank you for bettering this world and bettering yourself. And so I can only explain this if I give you a little bit of context around the way that I grew up and the people I grew up around. So growing up, I was raised in a extremely social environment. I mean, like constant stimulation and constant people. It was, I I can't think of many moments in my life, in my childhood, where I was ever truly alone. There were always people around me, um, whether that was my parents or my sister or my grandparents or friends. My life was very rich with social experiences and I feel incredibly, incredibly blessed that I was able to have those experiences because I think ultimately it really transformed the way that I socialize and taught me social skills from an early age. In particular, I think having a sister made a huge difference. Um, because she was born when I was about three years old. And so I was able to, I guess, subconsciously learn how to interact from her experience as well. And I think that tremendously helped. And so because of that, my sister being three years younger than me, I was about three years old when she was born. I was able to pick up on a lot of those social skills because I could kind of grow with her in a sense. And so I'm really lucky, honestly, that I have a sister. I've learned so much from her in such an unbelievable way. It's kind of amazing. And I think the course of my life would have been completely different had I been born an only child. I think that I really would have suffered a lot more because I wouldn't have ever learned anything related to social cues at all. And so every day I'm absolutely grateful for that. And she's one of the coolest people on the planet. And so growing up, both of my parents are extremely extroverted. I mean, literally every single weekend, hanging out with people almost every day um, on some occasions, constant interaction with other people. And so it was this strange dichotomy. Me being unable to read social cues and process social situations and deriving meaning from it combined with me mimicking them because like all kids do kids mimic their parents so when I saw my parents go talk to people I did the same thing so I was that three-year-old on the street smiling at everyone and saying hi hi (laughs) you know people thought it was cute when a three-year-old does it but then the three-year-old gets older and then they get kind of confused because it's like they expect you to grow out of that and develop some social inhibition. So basically, I was surrounded with incredibly social people, yet I had absolutely no social inhibition. And to this day, I've made most of my friends literally by going up to random people and saying hello or how are you, talking to them. Like the whole idea of social anxiety, I know that a lot of people, especially autistics, experience that but I have literally no idea what that's like because I kind of have the opposite experience. Having no social inhibitions, having grown up in a very privileged, safe environment, I had no reason not to be social because from a young age, I never saw any of that negative information. So if you're never, if you physically cannot understand or see negative social information, you'd, you'd have no reason not to be the most social person on the planet except that there was kind of a fundamental mismatch. People thought that I was some quirky extrovert. People thought I just really loved people because why else would I just go up to people and randomly start talking and trying to get them to talk about their lives? 
people thought I was just like really, really extroverted and loved to be around people. And that was actually never the case. I was trying to figure it out. From the age of four or five, I guess you could say, oddly, one of my special interests became people. I wanted to know why people did things. I wanted to know how they experienced things. I thought it was absolutely fascinating that when I was in second grade, that there was a girl in my class who cut her hair really short. And whenever I talked to her, she'd tell me about her life. And her life was so different from mine. It was, it was insane. I couldn't believe, you know, when you're a kid growing up in a wealthy environment, you inherently expect everyone else to grow up in that same environment, especially as an autistic kid. You think that everyone else is living your same experience. So it was a total shock to me to, to discover that this friend of mine was poor. I was like, what do you mean you can't afford it? Like, I, like, just the idea had never even occurred to me. It didn't even make sense. Like, I had heard my mom talk about poverty before because my mom grew up in pretty extreme poverty. And she would tell it to us. But, you know, from the perspective of a kid, it's almost like a story. A story that you can't really wrap your head around or understand. So that was probably one of my first experiences, just being absolutely blown away that people see life so much differently from me. And that was just from economic privilege alone. <laughs> so you can probably imagine how much of a shock it was to me to find out that I'm autistic at age 26 and not everyone sees details in life the way that I do. And so this mismatch continues in a lot of ways. I'll give you an example of this happened at work the other day. So something was processing on screen and there was like a little message about it. And so the way that I process information, a lot of times, is I'll say something out loud. Like, if, if, if a message shows up on screen, I'll read it back. Usually most of this is internal, but sometimes the mask slips a little bit and I'll say it out, out loud. So it said something like, no results found. And so I, I read it out loud because it's my brain's way of processing it. But my coworker incorrectly misidentified that as impatience. He thought that I was being impatient and wasn't willing to wait for the results. When actually what was happening was I was simply processing that a uh, change had occurred and repeating it. And so usually most of the time I'm able to mask well enough at work that people don't notice. But sometimes the mask slips. And when the mask slips, people don't understand. They, they really, they just don't get it. They think that you're impatient, or I'll give you another example. Uh, a few months ago at my job, this guy came up to me, this guy who's super nice, super wholesome, one of the, one of the coolest coworkers ever. And he had the most concerned look on his face. He looked like he was about ready to cry, and he asked if I'm okay. And I was shocked. I'm like, of course, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm very focused on what I'm doing. And it, it, it was confusing to me because I, I couldn't understand why he would have been so concerned or why, why he would ask if I'm okay. Does, is there some signal I'm giving off that makes it look like I'm not okay? Well, it turns out there's a fundamental mismatch of facial expressions from autistic people as compared to neurotypicals. So when I get upset, and most people get, most autistic people get upset, um, they'll kind of widen their mouth a little bit more, and, and it's, it's a lot more expressive, like, it, it, it's hard, it's hard to explain, but the cheekbones kind of rise a little bit more, the eyebrows kind of point together a little bit more, and it, it would be like looking at someone growling at a lion. That's the best analogy I can give. The same, the same thing that your face does when, when a, you would growl at something, or scrunch up your nose at something, that's kind of like what uh, discomfort expression is in, for autistic people. Now, compare that to neurotypicals. It's very different. It's incredibly different. And in fact, neurotypicals, the way that they express their, the, their emotions through their face, it's so different that it's very obscure. If you don't intuitively know what's going on or what these emotional signals mean, it can be very easy to misidentify them for people who are not neurotypical. And so, uh, for, no, for neurotypical people, 
basically these facial expressions are a lot more subtle. Maybe that's half of a smile, maybe that's like a slight, slight eyebrows moving together, or slight look of disgust. It, it's a lot more slight and a lot more subtle, and it's very hard to pick up on unless you're skilled at analyzing the patterns of facial expressions, or unless you are naturally, intuitively able to pick up on these subtle social cues. And so I think that the fundamental mismatch of facial expressions between autistic and non-autistic people causes a lot of problems. Now, maybe in the example that I gave, it wasn't a huge deal. So what if my coworker thinks I'm a little impatient? Well, it kind of is a huge deal, though, because even though it's just impatience right now, you know, I want people ultimately to understand what I'm trying to express. And communication is such an important part of our society. As humans, we were literally wired to be social. A bunch of new neuroscience came out recently showing how much, how many neurons start to fire when people make eye contact. And these neurons are more or less uh, deficient in autism. And so that absolutely puts us at a huge disadvantage because not only do we not get any information about that from other people making eye contact or these subtleties, but it also makes it really hard for us to express ourselves towards other people because when, when I'm feeling happy, I mean, my face lights up, I guess it's pretty obvious, but when I'm not feeling happy, people don't know. People don't know at all. And I would say that a lot of a lot of neurotypical people do this as well, um, but the difference is that I, I feel, personally, that neurotypicals do this voluntarily, whereas autistic people don't, which means that there's a huge mismapping, and it's very confusing. To give another example, when my sister was about five years old and I was about eight, she hurt herself from something, and I, I didn't see her hurt herself, but she hurt herself and she was crying, like, a lot. And I accidentally thought her crying was laughter. So I started laughing with her because I thought it was hilarious. And then it ended in a very bad way. <laughs> she was very bitter in that moment. She's like, why are you laughing at me? I'm hurt. And I told her, oh, I'm sorry, you were crying? I thought you were laughing. You know, in hindsight, this is a hilarious story to tell. But at the time, it was really discomforting for me because I always want to make sure that people feel comfortable around me and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to to have that level of comfort. But at the same time, I value authenticity quite a bit. I don't want to be someone else. I'm not going to be someone that I'm not. And so this mismatch, this mismapping, not only between emotional facial expression and everything else, it can cause a lot of problems. So I think that most of the time when people meet me, they think I just really love people. And in fact, to be honest, it, that is uh, very untrue. <laughs> I'm interested in people, yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm extroverted. In fact, I really value alone time a lot, and I need that, I need that as a way to recover from my daily life, particularly when lots of masking is involved, which is pretty much every day for me. And so I think that some people listening to this might think, okay, well, just be yourself then. Well, here's the problem. Being yourself as an autistic person in a non-autistic society, not only is it very difficult because you've been masking since age two or age one or even earlier, you know, masking, what happens is you start to identify with your mask. You think this is who I am. And it's kind of a very violent wake-up call when you realize the mask is not who you are and in fact you're so much more than that it's yes it's amazing to embrace that level of authenticity don't get me wrong i wouldn't trade it for anything but it's also pretty stressful to realize that you've become an expert at pretending when you were never trying to and so a lot of people say just be yourself and i definitely agree that authenticity is important but some people get really uncomfortable when they meet people that are different from them outwardly. And so, and the unfortunate truth is that masking in autism is often necessary, particularly for women, because we're expected to have a certain image 
and a certain way of presenting ourselves. And if a woman deviates from this, then she is viewed sometimes as a threat. She's viewed as different. She's basically outcasted. And I'm not saying that everyone's going to do this. Certainly, I believe there are communities that will openly accept you to be who you are in any way, shape, or form. But I think this is still the exception, not the rule. And so, as much as I would love to be myself, I can't exactly say, screw eye contact, I'm never doing it again. It's, it's important to people. It's important because they think, that they, they're trying to get information. They're trying to read me socially, even though I'm basically unreadable because whatever they think they're reading off of me is fundamentally inaccurate due to these mismappings. But nonetheless, this social aspect is really important in society. It, it still blew my mind when I discovered literally a couple of days ago that like 95% of people, like most neurotypicals, actually get a dopamine hit when someone says, how are you? Or talks about the weather or small talk. Growing up, I just thought it was a ridiculous social construct that we did for absolutely no reason. And I really didn't think much more outside of that. But it turns out that most people actually get slightly high from talking to other people, having small talk, and stuff like that. So I can't just abandon everything and say, okay, I'm going to be myself all the time. Because, number one, it makes people uncomfortable, unfortunately, because we grew up in a society that is designed for neurotypicals. That's the truth. Neurotypicals designed society, and that's why masking is so necessary in autism. In a community where everyone was autistic, would it be necessary to mask? Absolutely not. But then we also wouldn't have any anyone gaining information from eye contact. I would imagine the social rules would be completely different. Um, I'll definitely get into that in a future episode. But the point is that the way that I am perceived by all other people, unless they are autistic or ADHD, is fundamentally incorrect. There is a huge mismapping between the way that people see me and the way that I actually am. I think that I am much more of an introvert than I might seem because I need that time to myself to reconnect with who I am and to calm down from overstimulation and things like that. But not even just that. There's just a huge mismapping in general. People see me, they're like, oh, she's like happy all the time, like 100% of the time. And I'll tell you, no one can be happy 100% of the time. In fact, the real secret to happiness is being fearless and diving into your deepest, darkest secrets and fears and saying, I know that I am the source of my experience. And I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of all of these fears. It's okay to be afraid. If I want to be afraid, that's how I work through it. But to just totally deny that they exist is not the way. And so if you want to adopt some of these principles into your life, one thing you can try is meditation. Meditation has really helped me connect a lot with myself and my deepest fears and desires as well. And fundamentally, meditation improves neural alignment as well. So I think it's an incredibly useful tool. But it should be no substitute for being willing to take inspired action towards the type of present and future that you want to create. And so I'm open to suggestions for, from you all, actually. If you have any suggestions about how to make this perception and mapping more accurate, I would absolutely love to hear it. I'm always open for feedback. And if any of you have anything that you'd like me to talk about in my future podcast, feel free to send me a message and I will absolutely get to it. Thank you so much for listening today. Hope you have a wonderful day.